Okay. All right, I guess you guys took care of this already, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we are recording. And do we have people here? No, we don't. That worked already. Let me just double check. Okay, uh, I'm screen sharing, but okay, I can see myself. Okay, shall we get started? Um, okay. So today we have four presenters, uh, uh, Kit Lung and uh, Ling Liang and uh, Chung. Uh, and Stephanie presenting for this week. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you're questioner this week, right? Yeah, questioner and Merkel is also questioner. Okay, <laughs> just making sure about that. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. Yeah, hi. So uh, I'll be sharing on three LSTMs and quasi RNNs. So I'll first start with 3 LSTM. So I think last week what we saw was uh, the recurrent neural network. Um, and I mean the recursive neural network. And so the idea here is to actually apply the LSTM um, structure into that kind of tree network kind of thing. So um, if you compare this to a normal LSTM, uh, you can think of the tree LSTM as a more generalized version. In the sense that the standard LSTM would just be a tree LSTM but with only one child node for each internal node. So um, the difference then between the tree LSTM and the standard LSTM will then be how do you take in hidden states from more than one uh, child node. And so uh, there are kind of two ways uh, that this is done. The first is what's known as the Chow Sum Tree LSTM. So in this Chow Sum Tree LSTM, what's done is uh, the hidden state uh, is the sum of all the child nodes hidden states. So you just basically take all the hidden states from the children and then just sum them up. And then um, for the forget gate, uh, you use the same weight matrix to compute, um, to, to multiply against the um, child nodes uh, hidden states uh, to compute the forget gates. So uh, actually you can look at this from uh, the diagram here. It's a bit small, I realized, I'm sorry. But uh, essentially what it does is uh, you take the hidden state from the child nodes, you put them through the same function, and uh, use that to compute your uh, new memory. And for computing uh, i, u, and o, uh, what you do is you just sum up the two hidden states together. Yeah. And uh, so because you are summing uh, all the child nodes together, uh, this doesn't account for the order of the children. Uh, but the upside is that it can work with a variable number of children, so it doesn't really matter how many children each node has. Uh, and um, this can potentially be applied to something like a dependency tree or STM. Uh, the other type uh, of, uh, the other way of handling the different uh, child nodes is uh, the NRE tree or STM. So uh, it's very similar to the uh, child sum, except that uh, what you're doing is you're using a different weight matrix for each of the child, each of the child nodes. So instead of just summing up the hidden states, you are putting, uh, you are multiplying them by a different weight matrix. And because you're doing that, uh, you can only have at most n children for each node. Uh, but at the, on the upside, this allows you uh, much finer control over how the information propagates. Yeah, so uh, that's for three LSTMs. Then uh, for quasi-RNNs, uh, so the main complaint for RNNs are that um, they're slow and they cannot be run in parallel, and uh, this is largely because each time step the computation depends on the previous time step's uh, output. So you can't do all the things in parallel, uh, which is what the quasi-RNN is um, looking to fix. So uh, for the quasi-RNN, uh, at the top layer, the first layer, the convolution layer, uh, what it does is, um, as opposed to um, uh, normal RNN where you have to take in the hidden state from the previous node, uh, they try to line up uh, the convolution layer such that you only take in uh, the input vectors, the x. So, um, so with a filter width of 2, 
uh, what you're doing is you're just uh, multiplying uh, the inputs from the previous time period and this time period uh, by the different weight matrices and putting them into um, the functions. And so uh, because you're doing it this way, uh, you can actually run all of this in parallel. You don't have to wait for the previous time step to be completed before you uh, run the next time step. So <coughs> this brings us, so after you do that, you uh, come to the pooling layer and that's where the so-called recurrent type of uh, things occur. So there are a few pooling layers that they propose in their paper, uh, F pooling, FO pooling, and IFO pooling. Uh, the only differences are just uh, what kind of uh, inputs you are taking in at the pooling layer. So for example, for the FO pooling, you are taking in the forget gate, taking in the forget gate multiplying it by the previous memory, and uh, taking 1 minus forget multiplied by ZT, and the output multiplied by the current uh, uh, memory state for the new hidden state. So uh, essentially, in this uh, layer, you still have to process things uh, in sequence. But the idea is that uh, because at this layer, when you're processing things in sequence, the computation is not heavy. So uh, you save, uh, so all the heavy stuff was already done at the previous layer where you can run things in parallel. And when they applied this to language modeling, uh, they found that it was actually better uh, and it was uh, much faster. So it was up to about 17 times faster, uh, but that's dependent on the sequence length and the batch sizes. But what was also interesting was when they applied to sentiment analysis, uh, they found that it was again better and faster than LSTMs, but uh, it was also more interpretable. So the explanation for this was that um, at each uh, the, the activation at each of the neurons is not so much affected by the previous hidden states. So um, when you look at the activation for each neuron, you can actually attribute it to the particular word that you're looking at. So for example, so what they did is then they plotted the activations for each neuron. Uh, and like so this is the time step and these are the words. Yeah, these are the hidden units. So, uh, for example, for this particular review, um, at 117, uh, which is somewhere around here, um, what it actually said was not exactly a bad story. So, you could see that some, a lot of the activations actually changed uh, to, from something that's positive to uh, more negative. And then at 158, uh, it became, I recommend this movie to everyone even if you have never played the game. So, it uh, turned back into a more positive sentiment. So, this was shown in the uh, activations for the new one. And, yes, that would be good. Do you guys want to discuss the QCF, uh, QRNN uh, or, the, or the other paper a bit before going on? Or are you comfortable with that? I'm just looking at the paper now. I mean, this is a discussion group, so it's perfectly fine if we don't really understand it yet. What do you guys want to do? No inputs. Late in the semester, everyone's like bogged down. <laughs> okay, well, um, is this part connected to the QCRN or is it separate? It's separate. It's separate. Okay, why don't we spend a couple of minutes looking at the paper? Okay, so that um, we can take a look at what's going on. And what, I leave? Huh? Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's do that. Um, so Q quasi and take this one. Yeah, you guys can sit, don't worry about it. So, uh, and we're looking at these two parts where they're contrasting things that we already know, which is the, oops, what happened to my, um, we have our uh, normal LSTM and our normal CNN here, and then uh, what uh, was just presented by Kit Long uh, was the QRNN with the FO pool. So what does FO pool stand for? Do you guys know? Forget and output. Okay. Is that what you guys understand? Uh, so, for what I understand is that uh, FO, if it's forget and output, this is concerning the memory line within the LSTM. Do we remember about how the LSTM works, right? So, the LSTM still has the state representation that an RNN has, but it has this extra line uh, at the top where it keeps. Um, 
uh, memory information about long-term states. Do you guys remember that? Yeah? So if you go to Cola's blog, just in case you're not familiar with that. Right, he has this very famous diagram, which everyone uses um, to explain what's going on in, inside an LSTA block. So it's basically this part here where you have this memory line that's running through the memory line that's running through the LSTM and then you have all of the inputs coming in at a different state and you have your hidden state. So in addition to the hidden state, so the bottom part here is just the RNN, right? And then uh, you have this other functionality that's uh, influenced by the forget gate here. Uh, let's go to another one. We can find a better example. Yeah. Okay, uh, the forget gate here and the input gate here um, that is influencing the memory line. Right, what's going on on the memory. Okay, so uh, I guess what we're looking at here is something similar to the idea that you still are doing a convolution to calculate the internal state, if I'm not mistaken, and then um, you're using the pooling uh, layer just to calculate the um, memory sequence. Okay. Do you guys want to step through the math and see whether you can understand what's going on? Shall we do that? Okay, so uh, I'm going to read this with you. Given an input sequence x, right, um, that's our input line, right, then we have a, a, a set of convolutions that are doing the performance of x to z, right, so that's the usual um, Nonlinearity that's being uh, going on. You know, you could use 10H or you could use ReLU, whatever you want, uh, to produce your nonlinearity, right? Um, that's fine. Uh, then you have separate convolutions that are doing to do the element malai sigmoid function on the pooling at each time step. So here they're talking about a filter width of 2. Do you guys understand what that is talking about? Do you remember what goes on in the filter in a, uh, in a CNN? Right, the idea behind a CNN is you have a, a filter, usually in graphics or uh, images it's a square filter. Right, but it doesn't have to be. If you have a sequence, the filter would be one dimensional, right? So it would be a one dimensional filter, maybe taking the current time step, the previous time step, and the next time step. So you'd have a, a three by one convolution size, right? And so what they're saying is if you set the filter to two, meaning the current state and the previous state, you're, you're recovering exactly what an LSTM would normally look like, right? Because the LSTM is being passed information from the previous state as well as the current state. If you guys can find out more uh, about this and you'd like to describe it more in detail, maybe you guys can uh, search the web or put things on Slack. If you can find a diagram that's uh, a little bit more detailed than this one. This one is actually not very helpful, I think, uh, about what's going on. Linear blocks and element blocks. You guys have any input? Anything you'd like to discuss? You guys just on Facebook or anything else, chatting away with other people instead? Because <laughs> when I get deathly silence in lectures, it usually means like everyone's got a big question mark on the top of their head. Yeah. Up yeah, yeah, sure, great. Um, here, are we talking about the variable length input sequence? I mean, in, in normal LSTM, it's possible to capture that. Uh, yeah. You know, they don't worry about the uh, sequence to be fixed size. Mm -hmm. When it comes to classy RNN, is it possible also? So you're saying LSTM can handle random length sequences, arbitrary length sequences, 
Can can a Q RNN do that? Do we know? So uh, my guess is yes, because um, and I'm, I'm saying that without appealing to the theory, just because um, the paper talks about sentiment analysis, right? And the sentiment uh, analysis task. Oh, they have more. Okay, um, the sentiment analysis task is is definitely uh, the case where you have a movie review data set, and the movie reviews are of different length. So I don't know whether they said in particular that they truncated the uh, the reviews to a certain length or not. Two forty one words. Yeah, that's the average length. Uh, but I don't know whether they cut their length sequence to that amount. Um, they didn't say actually. Computational length and blah 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 blah. Twenty samples, each of. 105 time steps. So maybe they did cut it off at a certain point. It's not that clear. Uh, yeah, they do say something about the sequence length. So maybe they, they do have uh, a specific length that they're looking at, and they may pad. So a lot of times when you use a CNN over natural language data, because CNNs are not taking sequence into account, right? They're just doing, uh, for a particular window of text, they just run something and then come out with an output, okay? And uh, I guess uh, what they're doing in this is, is something similar to that. They're using CNNs and then just linearizing the memory part of it, so it's a sequence, right? Um, that, that they may have to have padding. Let's see whether the word padding is somewhere in here. Oh, yeah, okay, look at that, plum. This concept uh, known as mass convolution is implemented by padding the input to the left uh, by the convolution's filter size minus one. So uh, maybe they do have to do a little bit of padding for this. Good question. I think this mass convolution was meant to um, make it such that you don't look at the future time step. Sorry? Uh, this was uh -huh. clearly to make sure that you don't look at the future time step. Oh, okay. Right? So which was why you had to the left only. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so you... you Maybe this is just for the individual convolutions yeah. at each time point. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that seems to make sense, right? So in instead of having, let's say a three by three convolution, sorry, a three by one convolution, where you're taking a look at the current state H T, and you have um, uh, inputs from um, these time steps. I guess what Kilong is saying is you you pad out this one, right? Yeah. You take so you this take one away, so uh, you don't get to. Look that future state. So you may run all of these in parallel first and then go for the next one. Okay. Other questions? That was helpful. It helped me, anyways. So if you have a laptop, go please look at the paper um, and try to study it a, a little bit more, and then we can uh, ask questions on Slack or. Um, uh, Signal it out here so that everyone in the room can hear. So why are they pooling? Are you guys clear about why they're pooling? Anything you guys want to read about or say? We know that pooling generally in a CNN does the, the same type of thing that it would work uh, in this QRNN, which is that you're generalizing over multiple scales. Right? So when we do pooling, why do we do pooling in, in a convolutional neural network for um, vision? Do we remember why? 
We typically use max pooling instead of average pooling. Why do we do max? Yeah, you're basically saying, I see this feature in this subspace. I don't care where in the subspace it is, just present. Right? So for example, we, we talked about this last time. I made the example of the clock. Right. So if I want to caption this picture of all of you that I'm facing over there, I say, does this does this image have a clock? You know, it only needs a sub part of it to fire, right? So then uh, I can propagate that information to uh, higher levels of the network, which means uh, more coarse grain resolution until I get to the whole image, and then I'll still have the detection of a clock there, right? Otherwise, you're going to have that problem where if you average pull, it's going to smooth out, and you're going to that's going to disappear, right? Okay, um, let, let's go on since we, we can go on from there. But uh, I hope we can really use this as an interaction group. I know some of you are tired. I'm looking at this poor gentleman in the back over there. He's like nodding off. So um, I, I completely empathize with you. I'm always falling asleep. Um, but I think what we can do is uh, try to talk more. I think that's where we get the most insight is when we talk. Right? If we lecture, it, it gets very hard to concentrate. <laughs> okay, so we'll go on from there. So back to our slide. So uh, Ming Liang will present. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so now I'll be talking about neural architecture search. So the motivation behind neural architecture search is that we want to automate the process of finding different architectures for our neural networks. Currently, when we want to design neural networks, we are faced with many, many design choices like our filter sizes for CNNs or the number of units in our LSTMs. So, uh, and oftentimes the, these design choices require a lot of expertise. For example, if you want to choose between L1 or L2 regularization, you will often decide whether it's because whether you want sparsity in your features that you learn or is, it, is there any... Uh, <coughs> discrete uh, data in your data set. Yeah, so these are expertise that are required to choose something as like regularization, which, are, which is part of your architecture for a neural network. But there's also a lot of tribal knowledge when deciding on the, what design your neural network sh should have. For example, a good example of this would be VGG, where, they, where the paper recommended a good rule of thumb would be to reduce the filters, the number of, ch increase the number of channels by two times in the CNN architecture. Another example of that would be, for example, in ResNet, they would have the residuals, residual skip connections, um, jump every three layers, and then after that, somebody in the, the Facebook then later on write dense net where all the, all the, every layer is connected to every other layer with a skip connection. So there are many, a lot of these uh, different groups will tell you different things, and this is what we refer by tribal knowledge. So why not we just automate the whole process? And that's the motivation behind neural architecture search. So the, the, how neural architecture search works is that it has two parts. First is the controller. Second is the child network. So let's talk about the controller first. The controller is the RNN. And what it does is that it samples architectures. We'll later describe how it uh, samples the architecture. So uh, humor me first. So we talk about that. So we first it'll sample the architecture and then after and once it samples an architecture, it will form a child network using this new architecture A. To, and then after training this child network on whatever task, if it could be CIFAR, and you just train on the CIFAR data set, what you get is an accuracy. We typically use the validation accuracy, which is represented by R. And then by put, we then take this validation accuracy and feed it back into the RNN to guard to train the RNN to choose better architectures in the future, hopefully to maximize R later on, our validation accuracy. However, if you notice R is something that is not differentiable. You cannot just simply differentiate the validation accuracy of another neural network. So you cannot just simply backpropagate your R like a loss function, right? So how we do solve this? You can... So to solve this, we can view the whole problem as a reinforcement learning problem, where your controller is your policy and your validation accuracy R is your reward. And what you're trying to do is that you're trying to use your policy, your controller, to maximize the reward. So we can use something like reinforce, which is a policy gradient, which is what the paper uses, 
to maximize the expected uh, reward gain after um, after each time the controller chooses an architecture, right? So you will first initialize, then you have your current state, which is your current uh, neural net, your default neural network, then uh, your default child neural network, your action, which is your the new architecture, then your new reward, which will be uh, after training, you get your validation accuracy, right? And then you will then take the gradient of the log of the policy multiplied by the value function at that particular time step, right? Then it will train the weight of the controller, okay? So now we talk a bit more about how the controller works. So after you train the controller using reinforce, what you will do is that you want to sample your architecture, right? So this is how you sample your architecture. In this case, the example we are going to talk about, we talk about the CNN first. So for CNN, what we will do is that each output of your RNN controller represents a particular action. For example, and in this case, the action will refer to a particular design. For example, uh, in, one, in one layer, you'll first sample out the filter height, then after that, the filter width, then the stripe height, and then the stripe width, and finally, the number of layers. Yep. And you can not only just apply this to CNNs, you can also apply this to LSTMs, and, so if you, and RNNs in general. And if you apply this to RNNs, you can get to some pretty um, weird outcomes. So on the left hand side you just see the lstm and on the right hand side you can see that neural architecture search can lead to some very strange designs like yeah okay so how do we generate rnn so we just saw how cnns are generated where we just each output is a each output is a design feature that we can incorporate to our neural architecture so similarly we can do it for the same thing with rnns where each output again is a design feature for example uh it will tell you whether you are using a ReLU this time or whether you're doing a multiplication. So there's one important difference between a CNN controller and the RNN controller, and that is the output is then fed into this tree, uh, tree structure, which you can see over here. So it'll be fed into this binary tree structure. right? So you look at the previous hidden state and your current input, and then what it will do is that each tree index, so each of these tree index, it will then incorporate the output and the, the two outputs which is usually uh, addition or multiplication followed by activation function so you try to basically what it means is you either add or multiply the uh, hidden state on the current input and then after that wrap it with a particular activation function of your choice or what the neural network chooses yeah okay so after combined doing this a few times you can lead to Quite complex, uh, quite complex uh, RNN st structures, yeah, because the binary tree will build up, so we add complexity like this. And when we are, and what the team for net neural architecture search, uh, Quang Li and uh, Zoff found was that when you do neural architecture search on these RNNs, they found that the test new test complex uh, perplexity is much lower and than other methods at that time. However, this takes about 800 GPUs. So that's like a major, major flaw in uh, neural architecture search. It's great. You know, we, we, can, we can automate the whole process of, find, of developing neural networks. You know, we don't need data scientists anymore. We can just put it through this neural, neural architecture search and bam, you got a neural, neural network for you. But if you can't do it yourself. You have to use like Google level uh, co computes. Eight, like 800 GPUs, like not a lot of organizations have that. And there's another problem with 800 GPUs. You're putting like a lot of compute through a really small amount of math. So is neural architecture search really doing something or is it just random search? Is it performing like at random? And so one of the most interesting things I found after reading through the literature, so this is after neural architecture search paper. So like they, the team then did all the more research and they published a new paper in 2017 called Learning Transferable Architectures for scalable image recognition, where they compare neural architecture search method with a random grid, a random grid search. And, if, and so the random grid search is your blue line over here, and the red line is your neural architecture search. So you can see that neural architecture search is doing something. It's not like performing at random. Of course, you can say that um, they didn't really explore all the other possible ways of designing neural architectures. For example, you can use genetic algorithms 
yeah, but uh, they compare it the most the baseline of random. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, about comparing NAS with random search, but uh, how do we decrease the number of GPUs we need? And one way of doing that is we can use something called PPO. Okay, so this is an alternative to the reinforced algorithm. The reinforced algorithm has some problem suffers from a problem called high variance, where the <coughs> whether this actually I'm also not quite clear what high variance means in the reinforcement learning context. So I'm just guessing here that the that the gradient itself is, has a high variance. Yeah. And the problem with that is that you know your model can be learning a bit and then the update will be so big that it forgets a bit more. So yeah. It's kind of the sequence of actions the reward or the agent takes and then on the next episode, for example, if there is totally different set of sequence, that is the high variance problem. It focuses on the new set of sequence, on the new set of actions. Ah. So that is a high variance problem if you go with the policies. Okay, okay, that's new. Okay, yeah, I learned that now. Yeah. So PPO is a, is a variation of actor critic which just reduces this variance. And because it has lower variance than reinforced, it uses less GPUs. Yeah. So this was a paper subsequent from the original paper as well, by the same team. And recently, in the beginning of this year, they release efficient neural architecture search. All right. So efficient neural architecture search. The main contribution of this paper is that they find that the biggest bottleneck behind neural architecture search isn't the training procedure, but it's training the deep child network. Because you need to keep training a child network like a normal neural network. So that is the biggest bottleneck. And because you need to keep retraining the child network, you know, it's a quite expensive process. So what they suggested is that what if your child network, the, the child network you train, you can share the parameters. So let's say you train the child network initially between architecture one, you share the parameters you learn for architecture one with the new with the new architecture that you just got from your policy. So in this way, you're reducing the amount of training needed for your child network. Okay, so yeah, and they represented this whole uh. Per parameter, set, uh, parameter sharing procedure where you share your parameters between different architectures of your different child networks as a directed acyclical graph, a that graph over here, where each node represents a particular operation. Yeah. So, like for example, this would be um, the ten could be the ten H, or and then this could be like for example the ReLU, right? And you. And what they do is that the RNN controller now is a bit different now. So instead of uh, instead of choosing certain features, what happens is that now it just goes through the directed acyclical graph, where you can where the first input will be the beginning node, and then it chooses the activation function, and after it chooses the activation function, it then choose the next node it wants to go to this time. And because each node is uh, parameters are independent from other nodes. They can share the parameters because all you just need to choose now with the RNA is a path, yeah, to decide on new neural architecture. And somehow, and with this method, because you're now sharing parameters, you can reduce from 800 GPUs to one uh, 1080 Ti. So yeah, that's pretty, pretty impressive. It's a 1,000 times improvement. Yeah, yeah. So that code is from the original paper. The paper. Okay. So um, this is a newer one. So now, so NAS neural architecture search isn't the only way to choose your neural architectures. It is just one of the many ways. And I would like to talk about a much more uh, mathematical way. And, and, and I also like to talk about this because TensorFlow just released the GitHub repo for this actually yesterday. So it's quite cool. So what this does is that um, it basically sees the problem of neural architecture search as, some, as a learning problem, something that you can learn. So you can learn not only now the weights, the parameters, but architectures as you go on with like training on CIFAR. And how they do this is that they de develop this new objective function. Now you can read the paper for how this they get this objective function. I, they use some statistical learning theories. I'm like, I don't even understand anything. Like I just skip most of the sections because, but what they get is that they get this function, which they somehow prove is convex. So, which is nice, it's a convex function. Uh, I'm also not sure how they prove it is convex, but they prove it is a convex function. <laughs> and what they do is that, what you need to do now 
is that you can do some uh, empirical risk minimization to then both simultaneously learn the weights and the neural architecture. So they term this uh, ADANET because it's partially a boosting algorithm. Um, this, and this is from the paper as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm not quite clear on why, but uh, we, yeah. But it's like um, you can think about it like a boosting um, a boost <coughs> a boosting algorithm because what happens is that you are now trying to grow the neural network architecture. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Thank you. You guys want to go in detail more about that? We've been uh, previously putting things on uh, Slack. It's been used up. How many of you are familiar with boosting? Can I get a show of hands? Who knows what boosting means? No. Is it worthwhile to go over? I think it's, it's useful to know. So I, yeah. I will go back to the, the basic uh, undergrad course and give you a short lecture on that. Because it's fresh, because I just taught it last week. Um, So boosting is a, a really important concept um, that you should know because it has to do with ensembles. So uh, I want to give you an idea of what ensembles are. Okay, so um, that will help you put all of these different things together. So let's pretend for a second we have a number of models. Okay, so we've got um, some model, let's say a neural uh, a neural system that does H1. It outputs given an input, it outputs a y, so x, y, right? And the same for all of these other things. So you can think of these, for example, as stock analyst companies, right? You have all these people in Singapore, hedge funds, predicting whether to buy or sell a stock, okay? So uh, we just want to com compose all of these reports that we buy for, I don't know, hundreds of dollars to decide whether to buy a stock or not. So we're going to ensemble them. We're going to take all of their predictions and mash them up in some way. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So uh, you can do something like this. You can, uh, which is what we normally do, which is that we select the most trustworthy of the reports. So we have five reports, and one of those analysts, like a five-star predictor, always gets predictions much better than the other three-star predictors. We just go with that person, right? That's what we do when we do validation, right? When you do cross-validation, you're basically selecting the best model by testing all of those T models on some held out data, right? And then you say, okay, which one did the best? Oh, you did the best, so I'm going to pick you to be the star. You're the one that I'm going to, you know, prop up and promote, okay? Um, then you can have voting, right? Voting just means I have so many different reports, I let all of them vote, right? And then you can have weighted vote, which means I trust some of the hypothesis more than others. For example, over a 30-day period, I could say all of these T hypotheses that pick stocks, I'm going to look at how, many, how much money they made, how much money they lost, and dependent on that, I'm going to decide how much I weight, right? So I obviously want the ones that uh, did pretty well to be weighted more, right? Okay, and you can also combine the predictions uh, conditionally, which is what decision trees do, right? So a decision tree takes a, a particular test and then... Uh, looks at the values, and then for each of the values, makes a recursive sub-procedure, right? So there's another way that uh, we all know how to combine, and that's using stacking, right? What's stacking? Stacking is neural networks, right? The idea of stacking is very simple. You take the output of one classifier and plug it to the input of the other one, right? And that's everything we do in neural networks is just using basically like linear regression or perceptron, very simple algorithms that have linear units, and we're just sticking one next to the other and say, you, you, you know what, whatever you get as input, uh, uh, compute that, give me the output, and I'm going to take your output as my input and do the next layer, right? So stacking is what neural networks do, but it's not the only way we can ensemble things together. So when you hear the term ensemble, it just means the whole gamut of ways you can combine classifiers, and these are four different ways to do that.
Okay, so um, they're uh, they're also called blending. So if you hear blending, that means the same as ensembling. Okay, so uh, a lot of these things are useful because they work because of the diversity of the different hypotheses. Let's say, for example, you bought T stock reports, right? But they all say almost the same thing. Then there's almost no use in ensembling them together, right? That's the really nice thing about doing dropout on a uh, neural search, right? When you're doing dropout, when you're training a, a neural network, is because you're basically uh, training something like an exponential number of individual neural networks all together because of the way you do the dropout. Okay, you, you turn off random nodes at certain times, okay? So these are all ways of combining predictions of finished models. Okay, that means after the training process is done, you use them in some way together. All right, so what could we do? We could change the model while we are getting the data, right? Adapt, right? So when you see ADA in a title in machine learning, it almost always means adapt, right? It doesn't stand for ADA Lovelace. I, I thought it was ADA Lovelace, okay, when I was learning. I was like, oh no, it's not. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple terms that uh, you should know. So um, let me see. I, I don't know whether we want to cover that. Uh, but uh, I'll come back to that if we want to. Okay. So what boosting does is to try to think about what happens when you uh, build a classifier and you want to modify the classifier after it's built. Okay. So just like you would do when you're um, trying to learn a language. Let's say you have a deck of flashcards, okay, and you're memorizing vocabulary, right? Okay, the ones that you get wrong, oh, you know you have to revise again, right? The ones that you got right, not so important. You put them aside, okay? So what are we doing? We are basically going to increase the weight or the salience of things that we get wrong and then decrease the weight of things that we got right. Okay, so how do we do this is using a, a, a very traditional method, but you can see those methods still come back out, <laughs> even like today, because uh, these, these theories don't go old, okay? Um, it's the idea of boosting, okay? Adaptive boosting. So uh, let's say I have a classifier um, that's looking at a particular input, x, j, okay? And how does it work? It just takes... Uh, Let's say it's a, a binary predictor, so it predicts uh, y plus 1 or y negative 1, okay? So uh, when I get this hypothesis, this, this thing here, okay, it's going to return a plus 1 or a minus 1, and I'm going to check uh, whether when it's multiplied by some weight, uh, whether that thing is uh, positive or negative, okay? And I'm going to have, uh, as I said before, t of these classifiers, okay? All of these classifiers I generate at different time steps. Okay, and I'm going to sum them all together and then uh, get an ensemble weight. So I basically, I build one classifier, classify it, build another classifier at another time step, classify it, build another uh, classifier at another step, classify it, and then I'm adding all of these uh, classifications together times by some type of uh, weight variable. Okay, and then I take the sign of that to do the prediction. Okay, everyone, no problem, right? Okay, the trick here is that it needs to be adaptive, right? So when I build a new classifier, I want it to correct for mistakes from the old classifier. And how do I do that? I calculate how bad it does on some held out data set. Okay, validation, right? We all know how to do that. Okay, and what we are doing is uh, finding out the misclassification rate, okay, and then giving a weight to that classifier. Okay, this classifier's weight is basically uh, governed this way, in which we can think of a binary classifier that gets 90% correct or 10% correct are both equally valuable. Why? Because it's a binary classification test. If I get 10% right, I just flip what you said and I do the other thing. Right? You said the cell and 90% of the time you're wrong, then that means you're 90% of the right if I took the opposite of what you said. Okay, so that's what this graph is showing here, okay? That uh, as long as you're getting slightly better than random, which would be 50% chance, okay, in adaptive boosting, you can always, provably, if you can continue to run this classifier many, many iterations, 
you can always get within epsilon percent uh, correct uh, for that, okay? Just by running this algorithm, which assigns different weights to different classifiers, okay? So I, I'm going to skip this a little bit, but uh, I'll show you how it works. You usually hear about uh, adaptive boosting with decision trees, and the decision tree algorithm is basically a decision stump. Does everyone know what a decision stump is? Anyone don't know, then I'll explain it. If you all know, then I'm going to skip it. Feel free to raise your hand. Okay. So um, a decision stump is basically a decision tree that's truncated. Okay, so I'll give you an example, right? So here's one. Um, so let's say I have a number line. Okay, and let's say this is an input um, x1. Okay, let's say that uh, my problem only has one dimension and it's a real value. Okay, so all I want to do is learn a hypothesis that has three parameters. Okay, what are these three parameters? Okay, first I need to decide what feature I'm going to use. Well, this particular case, I only have one feature, one. Okay, so it's, it's just a, a, a univariate prediction. So I'm going to set that. Okay, if I have a multi-dimensional or a multivariate uh, problem, then there's multiple i's, right? The next thing I have to do is set the weight, okay? Meaning where on this number line am I going to put my threshold, okay? If you use a perceptron, it's, this threshold is at zero, right? Anything that's positive as a result is classified as positive. Anything that's a negative is classified as negative. Okay, but it doesn't have to be that way. I could say anywhere along this number line. Let's say here. Okay, so let's say this part is over zero. So maybe this thing is a positive value. Okay, so once I have the threshold, I need to decide which direction is the positive or the negative examples. So for example, if I say this side is positive, that means anything that has a positive value, an x1 value more than this amount, is classified as positive. Okay, I could have picked my S to be pointing the other way, meaning like that, which means that everything that has a value of this or less is a positive example. Okay, so that's what a decision stump is. You can think of it as like this. If I want to decide how much money you make uh, as a binary value, let's say more than 50,000 US dollars, and I have a continuous value, which is, for example, I don't know, um, the number of hours that you work, okay? Then I'm trying to decide what number am I going to stop at. Maybe it's like 45 hours per week or something like that, 40 hours per week. And I'm going to say everything above that is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, classified in the positive. Does that make sense? So that's what a decision stump is. It's a really, really stupid algorithm. Okay, but it is better than random. Okay, so that's how you can use this. You use the decision stump, which only looks at one input attribute, okay, at a time. So this is what we do. So for example, let's pretend this is on the xy plane, okay, or better yet, x1, oops, x1 and x2. Okay, so basically my input. <coughs> Uh, has two variables, two continuous variables, okay? And the output is basically the, these classes, right? My y value is either an, a red x or a blue circle, okay? So when I run a decision stump, what's going to happen? I'm going to pick one of these two variables. Pick a variable. Which one do you want? x1 or x2? x1, okay. Good choice x1. So we choose x1, we're going to choose the x1 value right here. Okay? And I'm going to say everything below this number is a positive example. All the things below which are in this direction, okay, are positive examples. They're blue circles. Okay? Everything else that's above this number is a negative example of red x. Okay? So what happened? I got most of the things right, right? Which ones did I get wrong? The blue circles, right? Okay, so what does Ada Boost do? It says, oh, the ones that you got right, just like the flashcards, don't worry about them so much. Next iteration, we're going to pay more attention to the ones you got wrong. Okay, so that's what it does, right? So the next time I, I, I build 
the same, it's basically the same instances, okay? They're just reweighted in importance using that formula of the alpha. Okay, this one over here. All right, so I have this alpha here. I'm just changing how important each of the individual instances are, okay, with respect to their history of being classified correctly or incorrectly on the last t minus 1 iterations. Okay, that's all we're doing. Okay, so the next time I run, I get um, these three were right, right, because this, these two were right for two iterations, so was this one, but everything else was wrong. Okay, the, the x's that I got wrong this time are here, and I correctly got these, but they were misclassified on the first run. Okay, so everything is again scaled, right? And I can do this a number of times. Okay, so that's exactly what uh, a, an adaptive system is doing. It's changing how important are the instances with respect to different runs. So when you think about this ADA net that Ming Liang was uh, talking about, it's basically doing the same thing, right? I'm training a network. That network gets a certain amount of loss. Right? That loss I can compute, and then based on all of the previous classifiers that I've built, all of the previous neural net models or iterations that I've built before, I can decide which of those examples are still hard, which of those examples are easy, right? And I can permute both the parameters of the network and the network architecture to make sure that I can get those things right in the next iteration, right? So it's, it's, adaptive because it's trying to figure out which of the examples are hard to get and it's catering the architecture search to get those things correct. So it's, uh, it's much more directed in its search than uh, the more brute force methods that we, we typically see, right? When we, when we have the words like grid search, you, mean, you know what it means, right? It's code for, I don't know what I'm doing, so I did everything. Right? But this one is saying, I'm, I'm trying to principally figure out which of the examples are hard and then tune uh, my next training of a next neural architecture based on the misclassifications that all of the previous models that came before me couldn't get right or couldn't get right often. Okay? So that's, that's what I wanted to show you. But I think a, a really important part of this is uh, that you understand what um, we mean by uh, ensembles, okay? So do, do remember all of these different things that are happening in an ensemble. So a quick question, a quick quiz to you. Which of these four options are actually being done by AdaBoost? Are we selecting the most trustworthy of them? Are we voting on them? Are we taking a weighted vote? Are we taking a conditional prediction? The first one? Okay. Any other voters? Is it the third one? Is it weight the uh, reports non-uniformly? It's the only one that has an alpha. So yeah, that's right. We're, we are doing this. Okay. We're weighting the uni uh, reports non-uniformly by whether those reports get certain training examples correct or not. Right? So it is voting because we basically take all of the different classifiers we've built and we ask them all to make a prediction, but we're going to decide which ones to trust more based on how many they got right at a, uh, on the training set. Okay? And then we build a new data set. We build a new data set by doing what? Not by creating more data, right? Just by reweighting. Reweighting how important each of the examples are, just like what you would do with flashcards, right? You're not building new vocabulary every time you go through. You're just saying, I keep on getting this stupid thing wrong. Okay, put it in the front. I'm going to review it a couple more times until I get it right. Okay, so that's the idea of, of that. Okay, so let's go to dynamic memory networks. So I will talk about dynamic memory networks. So first, uh, we see one example for motivations. Uh, this is a question answering. So, uh, the, so the context is that 
Uh, Jane went to the hallways. Mary walked to the bathroom. Sandra went to the garden. Daniel went back to the garden. Sandra took the meal there. And the question is, uh, where is the meal? So, uh, assuming we usually gonna, gonna attention, uh, put our attention to the last sentence, uh, which is Sandra took the meal there. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the first thing that we do, and then we know that we want to find the second clue is where is Sandra, and then we look at the third sentence. So uh, basically, we have the thing called iterative attention process. Uh, initially, we don't pay attention to the sentence that contains the answer. So uh, we want the model to do the same things. So we need uh, to model it. Okay, so this is a model of dynamic memory networks. So uh, this model contains mainly four parts, uh, the input module, the question module, the episodic memory module, and the answer module. So basically, the input module is going to uh, take the data and then transform it into a representations. So in this case, uh, the input module will take in a bunch of sentences, and then uh, getting out a representation of each of sentence as uh, indicated in S1, S2, S3, and so on there. And the, and the question module also do the same thing, uh, try to have the representation of the question. And uh, the third module is the episodic memories module. This is the thing that uh, we want to model. Uh, basically, we want to uh, get the using the questions, put some attention to the representation of the sentence, and uh, using it to put it into our memory and finding the second clue that we want to find. Uh, so we do it multiple times. And uh, easily we do it uh, three or five times, and then we get the final memories. And then we put it into the answer module, which will uh, give us the answer. So let, uh, take, let put detail into uh, each part. So the input module, uh, we are using a standard GRU. Uh, in this case, uh, every sentence, uh, we concatenate all the sentences into, into a, a sequence of words. And we put each word to uh, to uh, we put it to each word uh, step uh, one another time to the GRU, and just storing the the final word, uh, just storing the uh, last hidden layer at and each, uh, at the end of the sentence. We keep it as uh, the representation of each of the sentence. So uh, so if we the input we have is it is only a sentence, so we use all the hidden state of, of every word. Uh, and we also can put the end of a sentence token and using that uh, hidden state to represent the sentence. So basically, um, so in this case, we, we are trying to represent the sentence, but we represent it in one direction. We're moving from the left to right. Uh, so one of the ways we can improve it is uh, using bidirectional GRU. And uh, is mentioned here, but not, not only we use a bidirectional GRU, we also use a positional encoder as well. So uh, the formula for positional encoding is uh, position encoding is on the right. Okay. Uh, okay. Next is uh, the question module, which is uh, similar to the input module, which is uh, take the representation of the question using a GIU. Okay, so come to the main part, so, uh, which is a uh, episodic memory memory uh, module. So uh, firstly, we going to uh, have the, the questions and use this question to find what is uh, the, the thing that we want to find, the, the first clue. So we use the question uh, and, uh, and co compute the attention to each of the sentence. And we know which uh, of the sentence has uh, the most, uh, contain the clue that we want. Uh, and, we, uh, and we store it in uh, M. So basically is that uh, at, uh, at episode iteration T, using the previous memory and the question to compute the attention score, we compute it by using a similarity measure, Z, contains some, some kind of features and using and process this using softmax and then get an attention score, which is GI. And then we put GI into a modified GRU uh, and, uh, 
and process it to get the, um, the next memories. So to be more specific, uh, the similarity score we're using here is, uh, is the, the ZZI on the right. Uh, and the dot, dot here is uh, actually a two layer fully connected uh, neural, ne neural network. And uh, this is uh, the formula. So uh, I would also want to comment about the uh, modified GRU. Uh, so uh, this modified GRU have the ability to just forget about the previous, uh, just uh, forget about the, previ uh, the current sentence and just copy the previous hidden stage moving forward. Uh, because when the attention score of GI is equal to, to zero, which means we don't want to pay attention to that, to, to that sentence, and we can just copy from the previous time step. Uh, so we know that the GIU also has the ability to, uh, to do the same thing. But in, uh, but in this case, we are trying to strengthen that ability to, and to, to model it this way. And the answer module, uh, when we have the last hidden stage, we put it into the answer module. Uh, we have put each, uh, each, each, uh, each uh, word at the, at the time, and using softmic, uh, uh, using softmic to output the word. And one upgrade that we can uh, do about it is, uh, is a U pointer. Because uh, if we encounter a word that is not inside our dictionary, so using softmic, we cannot get that word. So uh, one way to improve it is uh, pointing to the, to the input sentence that we have. So we can copy the exact word uh, to, uh, to, to the answer module. Here, here are some related work. And uh, to compare it with memory networks, I, I will uh, describe a brief about, briefly about memory networks. So, so the memory networks will have uh, many that have an array of memories, that's the first thing that it has. Uh, it has a, a component, is, uh, which is input feature map. Uh, it is a similar to dynamic memory network. It's trying to, uh, to convert the raw sentence, the raw information, into the representation. Okay. And the difference is that uh, in memory network, it's not using any kind of uh, sequence model. It only uses uh, embeddings, and some feature like embedding POS and positional encoding to capture the, uh, the order of a sentence. They're not using any sequence model. Okay. Um, the second component is a generalization. So it, it's basically it's trying to train the memory, train the array of memories. Uh, when it takes the input, it trains some things. And uh, the, simple, uh, the simple way to do it is just putting element to the unoccupied uh, array, uh, cell in the memories. And the third component is a uh, output feature map. Uh, so this this feature map is uh, this component is typically uh, responsible for reading the memories and performing in inference. It is similar to dynamic memory network in a way that uh, it can uh, it can first output the output something and condition on it and look at uh, the representation a uh, second time and then output the second things. So. It can do it multiple times, just like dy dynamic memory networks. And the last is uh, the response, uh, which is converting the output, the, the encoded output, and, and try to decode it to the uh, to, to the raw sentence that we need. So as I have mentioned, all the they all, all have the input scoring, attention, and response mechanism. And uh, the difference is so so yeah. Okay, so uh, so this table records the accuracy, the comparison between mem memory networks and dynamic memory networks. Some of the tasks that uh, dynamic memory network can do better. Uh, for example, in task uh, in task two and three, have kind of long input sequence, and dynamic memory network do poorly on it because uh, memory network. Be okay. Okay, do work while memory network uh, because it view each sentence separately instead of uh, instead of putting into a long sequence of GIU. 
and for, for the task 7 and 8, uh, it actually, yeah, actually do the same. Uh, it, have, it requires to uh, iteratively look at the sentence and find the next clue, and uh, that is what uh, dynamic memory network can do better. So it's also uh, the result which uh, said that the dynamic memory network do pretty well. And also, uh, when they analyze the number of episodes in dynamic memory networks, uh, just I uh, said before that usually we use uh, three or five uh, episodes. And uh, in this case, we see in the last uh, task, uh, two paths is actually the best, give better result, and three paths uh, giving lo uh, slightly low better result, uh, slightly low re result. So we should consider the number of passes at hyperparameters, uh, not not uh, the more hyp uh, the more number of passes better. So it's also the result that uh, uh, for for this example, uh, if this example is about uh, sentiment uh, sentiment analysis, and uh, using like one iteration, one episode, uh, the model poor, do poorly. But uh, going to to second iteration, then the then, then it predicts pretty well, and it is also a, a hard and a, a hard task, I think. Also another example. And for uh, POS tagging, it also do really well. And also, uh, because uh, I have just said before that uh, the dynamic memory network comprises of three separate, uh, four separate uh, modules they can do independently. Uh, so for input module, it can take both text and can take in also image. Uh, just as long as it's output the representation of the input. Uh, so, so we can actually input the image to uh, the network. And the way that they do that is they have to slightly change the uh, the architecture of the of the of the input module. So in this case, for image, they uh, take the image and then using uh, convolutional neural network to extract some features. And those features are called uh, uh, local re uh, local region feature attraction. So using all the features, and we we want to project it into the visual feature embedding by uh, using a, a, li a layer code, uh, a layer, a single layer, fully connected layer with tang edge activation, and uh, the thing that we get uh, after that is the representation of the features. And also, we put it into a GIU just like uh, previously, just like a, just this slide. Uh, we put it into a GIU and then output the uh, representation of the input. And the result is uh, pretty good as well. And this is some, uh, so because we have attention in our model, so we can uh, visualize what uh, the model is actually focusing on. And uh, you can see in these pictures, the model is focusing on uh, the right things, as we expected. So this is the end of my presentation. If you guys want to discuss any of the component papers a bit more, I was busy trying to organize week 12 and week 13 while we were talking. So, um, any discussion that you guys want to do? Questioners or anyone want to pull up any doubts? All this flies very fast, so you, I, I'm sure most of you are pretty puzzled. So, yeah, Eric. Yeah, actually, I have like a question because, like, for the second paper that was presented, right? Um, they use a controller, uh, RNA controller, right? So, is there some kind of intuition to why um, the paper used like the RNA controller with reinforcement learning instead of just using like just some reinforcement learning uh, method, just like that? 
reinforcement learning method uh, typically, yeah, like even if you look at um, which paper are we talking about? The R, um, the neural yeah. network. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, um, even if you look at, let's say, um, how many, like DQN, yes. right? DQN, you will usually have, um, it makes sense why it's a convolution because you're using solving an image problem. Right. In this case, what they're doing is that when you do neural architectures, they're, they're trying to do each like, Let's look at this. I'll give the example of the CNN. Right. In the example of CNN, right, you want to focus on layer one, layer two, layer three, and each one will have your own, uh, each one will have your own, uh, features, uh, the design consideration, right? Right. The, the filter wave and stuff. So you right. can think of it like sequential, in a sequ this is a sequential problem, isn't it? That you're going from layer to layer. Like your layer two considerations are dependent on your layer one consideration. Right. And this is just some intuition I have there. Right. If you have any differing opinions there. Because I'm I'm just thinking, right? I mean, uh, they just use the RNN, but they adapted RNN uh, with a reinforcement kind yeah. of uh, uh, optimization. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it, the 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 question would be like, why did they do that instead of just using a a, a more uh, reinforcement method without the RNN? You know? Yeah, but because reinforcement method is controller. Yeah. Uh, uh, reinforcement. Yeah, because reinforcement learning, like I said, typically already needs a neural network. Because first of all, when you need a neural network in a reinforcement learning setup, because typically you have a large search space. And if you have a large search space, what happens is that you cannot just rely on tables, right? You cannot rely on Q tables. You have to generalize, right? That's why you have the neural network, is to generalize right. so that you can search through that search right. space. And the reason why we have done RNN, uh, use an RNN for a neural network is so that. Uh, the problem, as I mentioned, is if this because each layer, the later layers are dependent on the earlier layers design, so it, you have to generate them sequentially. Yeah, so this is some idea. So the reinforcement here is just to the yeah. Yes, correct. Is this because you see, you cannot just use fact propagation because the the thing is not differentiable. Exactly. Yeah. So fact propagation relies on the loss being differentiable, but in this case the loss of reward uh, is not differentiable, so they use a reinforcement learning strategy instead. Right. Yeah. Because typically for reinforcement learning, it's, it's kind of the other way, right? We have a reinforcement learner and we replace the Q table with something that needs uh, neural network. But in this case, they're using an RNN, but instead of using backprop, because of the limitations yeah. that you mentioned, they're using a reinforcement Optimizer, if you will. Other questions? So that was, I think, pretty helpful for those of you who understand and follow the question. Uh, is there a question or a discussion that we can be a part of? Okay. Other questions? How about for the current part about dynamic uh, memory? networks. This is stuff that's pretty new. It's about two and a half years old or so. So um, I think um, there's a lot of interest in this, especially if you went to Richard Socher's talk. So he's really into this stuff. You know, the, the, the lecturer at Stanford who gave this. As a, he's organized uh, many, well, when he came to talk, he talked about the NLP decathlon. So like many, many NLP tasks uh, that are being, um, in some ways, uh, jointly learned by a single model. And uh, mo the model is based off of this idea of a memory network. Okay, that uh, you're reading text and then you can attend, uh, as we saw in the attention is all you need paper, to different parts of the text. And then what they're introducing here is a storage technique, right? So you can store information as you're going on um, and then make inferences over those, right? So at each point in the network, you're paying attention to different items and then the higher levels are inferring things off of the intermediate stores um, up on the upper levels. So that you can get these nice causal inference chains that uh, we've always wanted to get, you know, that over multiple sentences, you can compose memories based on previous ones. Like we talked in the co-ref lecture two weeks ago, yeah, um, where you want to chain things from the previous and decide which things to keep, which things to throw away, all right?
you guys have questions, I, I thought, you know, the, the last couple of lectures are really, really interesting stuff. So I, I was hoping that you guys would have lots to say and, and think about, or are you like all tired from the semester? Oh, I can't stand it anymore. Nothing? You guys are all smiling, but no I words are coming that, out. Uh, for some of this topic, uh, so I cannot understand very clearly about this knowledge. Yet. I'm not sure if uh, you have the same feeling. I think uh, most of us in this room probably don't really understand <laughs> it well. But uh, I think the benefit is that we can know the latest model or method, what people are, they are searching. That's my thing, because it's difficult for me to ask some question, but meanwhile, I don't understand very clearly about this. You need to have some understanding to ask questions, is what you're saying, right? So without that understanding, you don't know where to start by asking questions. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's helpful to go over it slowly and then, you know, let it digest. So if uh, we want to go through the paper a little bit more, we can try to do that. So. You know, as much as I like the evaluation, the evaluation doesn't help me understand what's going on. So I think it's good to go through uh, the modules in a bit more detail uh, and understand through that. So, um, all right. How much of this slide do you guys get? None. Okay. So let's go through it part by part. Okay. So what, what what's going on here? Uh, and I'll need some help because I also don't know the slide. This is the first time I'm seeing this. Okay, so uh, we're going to look at the bottom part of this diagram. Is it in the paper too? I, I don't remember. Um, the end-to-end -end memory networks is another paper I'm looking at, which is a, a little bit more recent. But anyways, we'll start with this. Okay, so what's happening here? Can we try to deconstruct this? So what do we have at the bottom here? Do you guys know what this is? This is a sequence, right? What what what's being fed in? A set of sentences sequentially, right? Okay, so all of these are like word one, then word two, then word three, then word four, and that finally I come to the end of the sentence. Right? And what is this thing that's being run? It's this standard GRU. GRU is a synonym for an LSTM with fewer parameters. Okay, wherever you see G, uh, GRU, can replace it with LSTM. Wherever you see LSTM, you can replace it with GRU. Uh, both of them are what forms of a recurrent neural network, but with some memory. Okay, to handle this long, long distance problem. Okay, so what's happening at this point is what these blue points are what. They're the end of a sentence, but what's happening there that's important? The hidden state represents what at that point? It's building up what? A representation of the sentence, right? Yeah, just like we saw in the, the dependency, and we were talking last week about you know, operations or matrices or something like that. The entire goal of the encoder, right, is to take off these incremental observations of words, right, and then squish them into this uh, low-dimensional, very dense vector that's supposed to represent a sentence, right? So we had word vectors before, and then running something like a GRU or LSTM as an encoder is supposed to get us an incremental version of what the sentence looks like until we get to one of these blue nodes, right? So we get to this blue node here. That means the hidden state is somehow representing the sentence, right? Sometimes you'll hear that as a thought vector or a paragraph vector or a sentence vector or a document vector. Those are all the same thing, right? It means that I've run some sequential model over some hidden states and the uh, after all of that, I've gotten a hidden state representation that represents that, and sometimes that's coupled with the memory, the memory line that comes in the GRU or uh, uh, LSTM. Okay, all right. So that's why uh, Koi wrote here. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. 
Chung, okay. Chung wrote here that the last hidden state of the sentence is accessible because I'm reading in the input, I don't know what it means until the very end of the sentence. Once I have that representation, I want to use it for something, right? So that's why there's an arrow going up. Okay? So, uh, everyone clear about this part? Does this make more sense now? Yeah? My question. Yeah. After one sentence, will the network reset the state? So that means that S2 will be repeated the, the first two sentences or just the second sentence? Okay, I'm not sure about that. Does it reset or does it's not it not reset? It's continue from the last year's finish. Okay. So it's just composing all the way. There's no, there's no uh, anything to say that it's reset except for, for example, here, like it says at the bottom. Optionally, you can have an end of a sentence, and perhaps at the, if you read the end of the sentence token, it will learn that you know there's some special representation to it, and that maybe uh, for optimal uh, encoding, maybe it says after I read the end of a sentence, when I read the next word, I'm gonna forget a lot of things, right? So I can read afresh, right? That might be something that happens. Okay. Um, okay, so what is this picture? Where does this picture fit in on the last one? It's, it's basically like this small part here, right? Okay, so if I take a look between sentence one and sentence two, uh, I can think of like one of these as a sentence. This is sentence one and sentence two, right? And I'm um, encoding it into uh, a bidirectional GRU. Are we clear about what a bidirectional GRU is? Do you know what a bidirectional LSTM is? Yes. Okay. We read the sentence from the front and we read it from the back. Uh, both ways are fine because, again, we're trying to encode uh, sequential information. Certain things read better from the front, certain things read better from the back. Okay. So, um, you know, since we don't know any better, we're trying to handle any language pair we might read from both directions and encode both of those. Right, and then we are trying to um, put out facts later on. So, okay, so there's some positional encoding going on here that's just taking the dot product between the weight and um, its actual position, I think. Is that right? Okay, uh, and storing that in a particular place. I don't have any insight on this equation. If, if you have insight, um, please say. Number of word in the sentence, representation, dimension, some fraction of that times the sentence number of words. Did you explain this part, this equation? No? Okay. Well, we're not really clear about that. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah, the one that doesn't return the formula. Sorry? Yeah, so this is the particular dimension of this one. I'm not sure where it goes on the diagram, though. I think this is just talking about the dimension within the word embedding or, or, some, or, or the hidden state. I'm not really sure which one it's talking about. So I guess this fi is this uh, thing here, right? So it's saying that it has some uh, positional encoding of this sentence relative to its position in the paragraph. That's how I read it. Okay, so for example, if I uh, take the story that's up here, okay, and I change the order of those sentences, it should have an effect on what the output is, right? So I read those sentences in a different order, maybe different facts come out, maybe different inferences come out. Right, so probably what's going on here is that uh, I'm encoding that information about which sentence came in which order uh, by using this positional encoding here. I'm hypothesizing. I'm doing this blind without reading the paper. So um, please read the paper and let me know whether that's true. Okay. What's this? The question module. What is it doing? It's also a GRU. Right? It could be bidirectional too. Okay, what it's doing is uh, you have a text here, right? 
all of those input facts that you have on the I part here, all these things are being input. One, two, three, four, five in the sequence. I read them all. I get semantic representations for each sentence in the blue column, and I'm feeding that into the network. But I also need to know something about what the question is asking, right? So that's what I'm doing. Where is the milk? Okay. So this part is encoding where is the milk. And it's just doing the normal thing that a, a RNN or a LSTM or GRU is doing. It's just reading it, coming up with a hidden state that's representing that question, and that's its representation there. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Then what's happening next? Right? We're taking the question, right, and we're passing it, well, it's, 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 it's in parallel. We're, we're giving it to each of the sentences, okay, and asking, are you relevant to answering my question? Right? So here, okay, let's say John moved to the bedroom, right? Uh, John went to the hallway. John put down the football, okay? And the question is, where is the football, right? All of these other things with Mary went somewhere, uh, blah, 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 Mary traveled to the hallway, Sandra went back to the kitchen, Mary got the milk from there, they don't seem very relevant. Okay, so there's a, a some type of operation, usually some type of what is it doing? Some soft, uh, some similarity measure, right? Is that what you wrote? Okay, that's being uh, dotted between the state and the module, the question, sorry. Okay, and that's going to be fed over into this network. All right, so I have two memory lines here. They're storing different pieces of information. For example, one might be information about the football, which looks like this one here, okay, and this one might be information about uh, John. Looks like that's John, yeah. I think it's not doing parallel, it's still doing the first, uh, the first line first and then moving on the second line. Oh, okay. Oh, right, 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 okay. So here we're doing one calculation just for uh, paying attention to this particular sentence as opposed to all the other sentences. Sorry about that. Okay, and then uh, on the second layer, we're taking this this sequence of inputs and trying to figure out how it pays attention to the the second level of memory. So I forgot what the explanation for this is. I, I remember it from before. Let's see. Uh, basically, it is uh, using the question. Calculate the attention to each of the sentence, uh, each of the representation in the sentence. Mm -hmm. Having that, we put it into the GRU, a modified GRU, and then we get the mem new memories. Using that new memories and the questions, we do the same things. Uh, uh, compute the attention, uh, compute the GRU, and get the, the final memories. So it's the same GRU being employed multiple times, right? Okay. You guys all get uh, what Chung was saying? Right, so uh, in the first pass, what we're doing is trying to use the question to attend to which of these sentences get activated. In this case, there's a, a clear indication that football and football over here are relevant. Right, so this sentence gets activated strongly. Right, so uh, I can again compute, given this sentence is relevant. Um, Go back and find out what else is applicable, right? In a in a second computation, is that correct? Uh, we, when we calculate the attentions, we accumulate all the it, it into the memories, and using the newly created memories and the questions, we'll find again. Okay. We'll do the same thing. Okay. So you're basically taking the memory that was computed at the first time step and using it to recompute attention over the sentences again. Right, so the fact that the uh, you know I had put the football here, now I know John is somehow involved. Right, so when I recompute that, then I'm going to get an activation for John and uh, John here because those are the two sentences with the word John that came previously um, to to this one. Right, that also happened to mention a location. Right, so then it's going to pull this up. This one is also important 
but it comes earlier. So um, I think here you're getting the idea that the bedroom might be a plausible location, right? But this one is closer by because of the positional encoding that we saw, okay? So this is has a higher activation or higher attention. Is that correct? Okay. So then with this multi-level processing, basically here, we're inferring that John is relevant to this problem because it shares uh, context with a noun that was found in the question, which is football, right? This says football. So this sentence and, and this sentence here should, should be important, these two, right? Okay, so this information gets propagated to this memory level. Okay, and then I'm uh, using causal inference, using attention again, right, to say, okay, if this sentence was important, what are other sentences that are important to this sentence, right? And we can do that through collocation, right? So we have football here and John here, and then I'm rerunning that. So I get John as another thing that I need to pay attend, uh, uh, attend to, and then I'll find uh, sentences like this one and this one. So this is doing like chaining co-reference, if you will, right? Going back multiple time steps uh, for each level is going back another inference step and then uh, composing that so that we can get an output. So at this point, I know that uh, I have both um, John from the first level and um, hallway and bedroom as possibilities in the second level. I use all of that information plus the question and I calculate where it might go. Okay? So I think, uh, do we all understand the entire diagram a little bit better now? Yeah? A little bit more transparent? Okay. Yeah, so you may want to look at the Weston paper in, in more detail. I haven't read this paper yet, but I, I will, um, so that we can get somewhere with that. Okay. Okay, so um, that's all the slides that the team had to present today. Uh, do you guys want to look in depth at any more of these parts? You guys look pretty, pretty gone. <laughs> Okay, let's call it a day then, shall we? Okay, so uh, we have week 12 and week 13 left. So week 12, we have um, certain presenters that hopefully are here. So um, can we get a hand of people um, who might be in the audience here? Uh, Nipun Batra, uh, Bala, Davis, Hawking, and Poi Ni. Are any of you here? Okay. So you guys are responsible for week 12, right? Okay. Um, are any of your questioners here? Miracle, I think, is online. Taka, I saw online, too. Um, Chung is here, right? And uh, Min Huang is not here, is he? Oh, you're here, okay. Uh, and Gary, Gary was online. Okay. Well, you guys are all responsible for helping out with the questioning activities next week, okay? So for those of you this week, like Stephanie, I think is a uh, questioner this week, we need you guys to compile a summary uh, and then post it to the general channel. Okay. Week 13, uh, I also think it's good to get started. So Eric is here. He's one of the questioners. Daniel Liang, are you here? I saw you online. Um, Louis uh, and Koi? No? Uh, Ming Liang is here. And uh, Serena Ku, no, okay, and uh, Vikash. And our presenters are Rahul, Julius, uh, Yong He, and uh, Min Huang. Any of you here, presenters for week 13? Okay, so you need to probably check with your other presenters, see whether you can find them, yeah, so that we can uh, make sure there's enough people to present, okay? Again, no worries if there's not, then you can just pick some part that you're interested in to present. Okay? I thought we had a lot of interest in week 14, that's why I didn't put too many people on it. Okay. Um, I do want to go over one thing. 
And that's uh, what's going on for steps. Okay, so um, uh, I still haven't seen a lot of people put in information uh, into this system. So I um, want to make sure that all of you are actually that are giving that said you were going to do a project are actually listed here, um, and then making sure that you are actually going to present. So. Uh, can I check with all of you who is doing a project? Okay, are all of you updating, have updated what you have written here? Anyone not? It's okay, just tell me. Okay, so if you haven't, please do so. Okay, it, uh, we also need to figure out who is not doing a project and I'll have to delete their projects off of here. So I think some of the PhD students originally said they were going to do projects and then they, they ran out of bandwidth or decided not to. Okay, or we had some people who joined the course at the beginning who couldn't make the time commitment and they dropped. So uh, we need to check who those are. So if you know any people who are in your presentation group that decided not to do projects, let them contact me. Okay, all right. Um, and then let me give you some ideas of what's going to happen that evening. So it's a two weeks from now on Wednesday, right? So it's the day before our last class. Um, we will be here. Okay, on this part, which is um, in the aircon section of SOC, just up the stairs from the business canteen. Okay, the business canteen is somewhere over here. Okay, so you walk down, and then right here, we will have um, somewhere around 15 to 19 presentations by all of you. Okay, so uh, you're already registered, so you just need to show up. Um, and there are some other things that I wanted to let you know about it. Let me see what I can find it. Okay, um, some things that are going on. Um, your posters need to be A1 size. And they asked that the orientation should be portrait. I didn't know that until recently. Um, you can put uh, the logos of IMDA, SEA, and Indeed, and SG Innovate on your poster if you'd like. Okay. Um, please use larger font for your project ID. So your project ID looks like, like this. It will be CS6101. And then your project ID, your project ID, you can see from, from the, that, that page, right? So for example, if you're doing the foreign exchange forecasting, I think these are the OCBC folks. Are any of you here? Yeah, then uh, your, your, your poster would be CS6101-04, okay? So please write that at the top left corner of your poster, okay? Um, you can print them here. If you're not local and you don't come to SOC until something like tonight, then uh, we can assign some people to help print them. Okay, so um, we have some undergraduates and, and some graduate students. If you are able to help out, um, just raise a voice on general, and then um, that will that will be great if you can help. So uh, they tell us we're supposed to pres uh, print our posters on November 12th. So that means just two days before the event. That means Friday. Uh, sorry, the Monday before steps, okay, you can um, make sure you have the poster uploaded somewhere. For example, you can share it on the general Slack channel, okay, and then uh, we can try to get somebody to print, print it for you, okay. Then we'll store them in the undergraduate office where I have an office there so we can just keep the posters there and then the night of, we'll put, help you put your posters up, okay, or you can retrieve your poster yourself, put it up, and then um, that evening, uh, I suggest that you, you go around to present uh, your poster and, and then, of course, go around and see what everyone else is doing. Okay, uh, We probably won't have a, a laptop or plug-in or monitors at the event unless you request one. If you want one, please let me know and we'll try to do that. Otherwise, bring an iPad or a laptop with charge if you want to present anything like a, a system that people can try. Okay. Uh, you don't have to register, 
because you're already registered. So that means you will uh, get a badge from me with a food, food coupon. Okay, so it's the normal, um, you know, local buffet of uh, Bihoon and stuff like that. Okay, so you can um, eat that uh, as well. Okay. Okay. So um, that's about all I have for that. Uh, you're welcome to go through through this in detail. There are, are quite a lot of other uh, different projects going on. So, for example, there's a information security course presenting uh, projects there too, um, and you can see all of the different things that are going on. Software engineering, uh, computer security. You just saw that. Our machine learning module that I'm teaching, uh, some of our students are, are working on that. They, they will be putting their project materials up very shortly. Um, then we have uh, game development. Those are always the most fun to watch. Um, enterprise systems, industry intern projects, uh, capstone projects, and FYP projects. Yeah. OK. So uh, please go ahead and update, and we will see you next week. Thank you very much. Let's thank our presenters again for our job well done.